Grace. We'll be uh, running the Zoom lecture and answering the questions for the people who are on Zoom. And um, it is my pleasure to introduce Professor Prakash Nalathambi. He is the Associate Director of Research at the Notre Dame Barthoum Institute for Precision Health. I almost said that right. I'm an assistant research professor in Notre Dame's bioengineering program. He studied industrial biotechnology at the Anna University and received his PhD in biomedical services from Old Dominion University in 2010. Following his postdoctoral fellowship at Oak Ridge National Laboratory in Tennessee, he joined Notre Dame's bioengineering program in the aerospace and mechanical engineering department as a research assistant professor in 2017. For those of you who don't know, if you're an engineer, they don't know where to put you, they put you in aerospace. So, <laughs> so he has over 14 years experience working with nanoscale sensor materials, the current focus of his laboratory. His lab studies these materials in order to identify defense mechanisms of abnormal cancerous cells with the goal of providing new avenues for early detection of disease and targeted therapies. The nanoscale sensor materials generated by Professor Nalan Levy and his team have been used in real-time biosensing of live cancer cells and, is, and as diagnostic tests to help, I think I wrote that wrong, <laughs> tests to help uh, drug resistance within cancer cells. True to his vast interdisciplinary education background, Professor Nalan Levy is also interested in nanotaxology and scaling up of nanoparticles from lab scale to pilot scale, as well as the role of plasmonic nanoparticles in the area of renewable energy sources. His research has been published in more than 30 peer-reviewed journal articles, cited more than 2,500 times, and he currently has seven patent applications. And if that doesn't make him superhero enough, he is the father dad of two teenage boys. Please give a warm welcome for Professor Prakashner. So I'm here in my capacity as mostly the Associate Director of Research at the newly endured Berkeley Institute for Precision Health. Uh, so what I'm trying to do is I'm just trying to do a really high overview of what Berkeley is. Um, what we do at the Institute, a few examples of uh, some of the cutting edge diagnostics. I'm not on the diagnostic side, I'm more on the therapeutic side, but I'll give you a few examples of some of the processes of doing that. And then I'll wrap up this talk uh, by focusing more on my projects. Uh, one which is focused on label free targeting of metastatic cancer cells, uh, which is how I work closely with hardcore cancer research. And the other one is an equally important problem which tackles. Uh, the evidence of new antibiotic resistance mechanisms and how we tackle those bacteria without actually conferring more resistance on them or creating more resistance traits. So, um, as you can see, uh, we have both of you, we have Harper. Uh, I've also worked with Andy Dino and I'm here to work with them. And then American Cancer Society and Indiana CDSI, and these are all organizations that I work with very closely. So, the very high overview, uh, we have Nordame and its strategic research initiatives. Uh, this has been going on for 15, 16 years. And uh, Birmingham is actually one of those institutes. It's part of that. It started as a center and uh, recently got endowed by an external grant uh, where we have an institute status now. Uh, but we have the only thing that's part of the ecosystem. We have uh, Indy Nano, uh, we have a wireless institute, we have Harper. Um, industry labs work with local industries uh, and trying to automate them. And uh, we also have the newly uh, emerged Lucy Institute, which works a lot on data analysis and big data analytics. Uh, so, Nordheim has been putting a lot of money to this. Internally, they've also been hiring top talent, all with the aim of increasing the ranking of our institutes. And within that, Sorry. So within that, the Precision Health Institute, uh, our focus has been uh, we bring in the right people. Uh, we have more than 70 employees uh, or faculty. Um, we also have external uh, experts who act as consultants. Uh, we uh, actively go after facilities and instruments that would help our faculty. 
um, to improve their research goals and research uh, results. Uh, because some of these instruments, uh, they're in the order of millions of dollars and it's impossible for a single faculty to buy and maintain them. And then uh, we also forge partnerships uh, with um, clinicians, physicians, uh, with industry partners like Pfizer, Merck, or even analytical partners like Agilent. All of this with the aim of uh, putting our faculty, like taking them out of the bubble, which is the academic zone, and putting them in touch with actual real world people and real world problems. So that because our biggest focus is always translating our technology from the lab uh, into the world so that it can be used to solve real world problems. So normally this should be at the end of the presentation, but I'm just going to put here the major goals are, and I have put this at the end of the presentation as well, is to tackle disparities in healthcare and inequities in healthcare by using technology as an equalizer. Um, this is this is the case that we can use technology, we can use portable technology to make it cheap so that everyone can access it. Things become expensive when people have to go to a big building into the hospital. Um, and many rural areas are completely underserved because of that. Uh, what we are hoping to do is, and we are in the process of doing this, is taking the hospital, decentralizing it, and taking it to the point where you can do in home services. <clears throat> then uh, the other thing is, we are always actively looking for clinical partnerships and consultants. Uh, consultants can be clinicians or FDA uh, consultants who can help push these technologies or advise us on how to push these technologies from the laboratory to the real world. Uh, for example, uh, we might be working on a problem because we think it's very interesting. Uh, from a basic science point of view, this might be the most awesome thing and it's going to get us a great publication. Uh, but from a real world point of view, it may have no value immediately. It may have, might have value like 15 years from now. Uh, but from a real world point of view, they might just be saying like, uh, we just want to kill this bacteria as efficiently as possible. We don't really want to know how exactly this bacteria is working with business. So that's one of the things where clinicians and physicians come in handy is uh, kind of bearing us back into, hey, there has to be a real world application to this. If you want to translate this, it's not always about going after the science publication, financial publication. Um, then the other thing is NSF and NIH allow us to get our funding up to the PR report, technology readiness level four. Uh, which means you discover an animal model. Uh, but really, if you ever get it into the real world, uh, we have to be a technology readiness model. So there's a gap in funding normally associated with four to six. So we do try and help our PIs network with foundations, investor consortium, government consortium, or even uh, DOD and uh, other HHS federal program offices that can help us bridge this gap to get it from PR4 to PR6. And the reason for that is uh, this actually allows us to license or partner with companies. Companies are mostly interested once it gets to this region. Um, and of course, we are always looking for partnerships and collaborations either with uh, clinicians, physicians, or other universities, and even industry to see how we can validate platform technology in more than one disease model and for using it in multiple use cases. So keeping this in mind, <clears throat> Berthium has split into five themes. Uh, molecular mining, molecular recognition, microbiome and human health, micro and nanoscale biomedical instrumentation, and point of use platforms. So, all of this can be, uh, you can put this up on our website. Um, but the other thing theme is like these are all interlinked. And normally, this two over here involve a lot of lab work and in silico simulations. And using that, you can discover new materials which can then be applied to either. Human health, uh, microbiome is a very hot topic now, how you can manipulate or use it as a diagnostic tool. And the other thing, of course, is what I previously mentioned, where you take instruments, uh, miniaturize them, make them more cost effective so that it's accessible to a larger swath of the population. And finally, this is our uh, kind of like a tip of the spear because this is where uh, we actually take it into the field. We have PIs who go into like Northern Michiana or uh, they go into Central Africa, Central America, and South America, and use these platforms to test for diseases like malaria, um, dengue, chikungunya, as well as uh, they also use it to test for concrete drugs and other things like that. So the way we are trying to grow and have the impact is uh, twofold. One is, uh, like I said, we're always looking to hire new talent. So Norden, 
and lithium having working on these cluster initiatives, uh, which essentially uh, we try to hire people who are uh, synergistic and symbiotic. They might be having different expertises, but together as a group, uh, they will have more of an impact in solving a problem than alone. So that's what cluster initiatives are, and we have some of these going on that we are funding. Um, we also worked with Purdue and IU. We formed a consortium uh, for analytical science and engineering. And uh, that result of that consortium is what resulted in an NSF funded center uh, where we have at least 30 companies, many of them bottom kind of companies, who come to us and tell us, like, this is the problem that we have that we're trying to solve. And this is the amount of money that we can give you guys. Do you have any ideas you can solve the problem for us? So, again, this feeds into the whole fact that uh, not only are we doing basic science research, but then we're also trying to go out, figure out what the real world problems are, industrial and manufacturing problems are. And this is a great example of how we're doing that. And this is Normally, a five-year program, we are into a fourth year, and we fully expect it to be ready for another five years because um, these companies are happy with the solutions that are being provided, uh, which means we are on the right track as far as how we are going. So, I'm going to reiterate: uh, Birdium uh, Institute is not—it's not something that just happened overnight. Um, this actually started about 16 years ago. Our director Paul Boone was hired. And then he started the process of bringing in talent like Sir so Maria Lieberman and David Rose, now the chair of AAB. Um, and then um, Professor Paul Horn pitched the idea of the Advanced Diagnostics and Therapeutics 14 years ago, which ND Research funded. And then uh, with that, we formed this consortium that I talked about previously between Purdue and IU Bloomington. It's called the Indiana Consortium for Analytical Sciences and Engineering. And simultaneously, uh, Paul pitched the idea for a hiring initiative called Ascent, Analytical Sciences and Engineering. And this is funded by the university as well as any research. And this resulted in people like, these are, he's like a giant in the field of uh, DNA sequencing, like Norm Dewitty, and then John Camden in the field of uh, nanoparticles and SIRS. And so we make, we continue to make a lot of hires. And then recently in 2018, uh, the upper trajectory that resulted in CDM being founded. And then as a result of all this groundwork, um, development pitched the idea of this analytical advanced diagnostics and therapeutics, and the both teams funded us or endowed us in 2020. And that's what we are in the current form. But really the foundation for this started 16 years ago. And we are continuing to go out with bigger and grander things. Uh, uh, to put it in context, uh, we are one of the centers that have been selected to go after what is called as the NSF Engines of Regional Innovation. It's a $160 million grant over 10 years, where it's not just the universities, but the universities working with regional governments and industries to actually become an economic driver in the region. So we are continuing to go after bigger and grander things because we want to expand and we want to have an impact locally and regionally as well. So, I'm just going to start with a few one slide examples. I mentioned John Camden. Uh, he does a lot of work on detecting spurious chemicals. Uh, so, one of the things he's been working on is uh, essentially uh, they use what is called a Raman spectroscopy. It's a handheld device, and first responders can carry this and see if they have been exposed to fentanyl, which is a big problem in the local area. Uh, so, they can take swabs, put it in this device, and we immediately tell them if it's fentanyl or not, then they can proceed applying it. Uh, it can also be used to uh, detect like adulteration and gasoline and other chemicals as well. Uh, but this has been an application that has been very well received. <clears throat> Similarly, Maria Lieberman, uh, she makes these paper devices. Uh, these are fantastic because they don't need any electricity. Uh, they don't even run on a battery. They just uh, paper microfluidic devices, um, and what she's been doing has been like she's been looking at lead contamination locally, uh, but she's also taken this to places like Kenya and uh, Tanzania, where there's a huge problem with counterfeit drug, drugs. So if a person is undergoing chemotherapy, uh, they don't know if it's been adulterated or not. So they can use this device, dissolve the drugs, run it through this, and if there's a color change, which would indicate adulteration, they can immediately see it within a matter of 10 minutes. So Again, this goes to the point of use, uh, having a 
impact on health disparity and also um, this social inequity as far as healthcare is concerned. These are the kind of things that she's having. And we're very proud that she's a part of our institute and actually one of our team leaders. And then one of the more fancy things, uh, I know these are a bunch of cartoons, but on the right, what you see is an actual real thing. Um, so this is uh, Nosan Newton, who was hired two years ago uh, as a chair professor. And uh, what he's been doing is uh, very simply, he knows and he done. Uh, E-NOS is a gas sensor, e tongue is a liquid sensor, and so he has incorporated this into the format of a variable watch. And what you can do is, um, this is something that is used by, it's being tested by people like, for example, firemen who go into a confined area and they can use that to see what is the amount of oxygen there, uh, what is the amount of other organic compounds there which should not be there, and how long can they stay in there, because it's not just a question of inhaling it, some of these things that you expose your skin to it, that's also going to be a problem. Uh, the e tongue is uh, just something that needs a liquid to sample. And this is something that they propose to do. Uh, if, during the whole COVID thing, people are actually analyzing sewer water to see if there are viral particles. And you can actually um, figure out if the community has an outbreak of virus. Uh, but beyond COVID, you can also use this to track flu viruses and flu outbreaks in the region. Uh, and so this is really cool. Uh, this is something. Uh, uh, they finally put it together in a watch format, and uh, because it's pretty cool, we also have a meeting with the Joint Chief of Staff, White Assistant Joint Chief of Staff in a couple of weeks, and uh, we're trying to see how we can incorporate this as an educational format for maybe ROTC personnel who are here um, to make them more aware on how to make variables and how you compare these data and so on and so forth. And so it's, we have a ton of these people doing a lot of cool stuff. Um, and uh, I just don't have time to talk about all of their things, but I would totally encourage you to get in touch with me or with anyone else on our website, and we can put you in touch with these people as far as gathering more information. So to kind of wrap it up in the last 30 minutes of this talk, I'm going to just talk about my research, because that's what I'm most comfortable with. Um, and so, like I said, my research is more on the therapeutic side. Um, Whereas my director, he's uh, mainly focused on the diagnostic component. Uh, but it's good when you diagnose something, it's good to have some way by which you can treat it. So we have like four flagship projects. I'm going to talk about the first two in this uh, presentation. One is uh, we have these magnetoelectric nanoparticles on which we do not have any antibodies or anything. We just tune the electrical charge on it and we're able to target uh, metastatic cells very. Uh, specifically and uh, with very high efficacy. The other one is uh, something which I think is a big health problem that people are not very aware of is that antibiotic resistance bacteria, uh, they are multiplying in number and we are running out of antibiotics and we are not discovering antibiotics quick enough. And so we came up with an antibiotic free formulation, uh, which we are finding has really good broad spectrum activity. And uh, we are of course talking, we have patented this uh, we are also looking into different applications to service DOD or uh, hospitals where hospital acquired infections are a huge problem. Um, we have taken the magnetic concept and we have also used it for de editing. Not going to go into details on that. And similarly, uh, we have taken this uh, structure and uh, we have also created bi specific nanoparticles, which means it can target two things simultaneously. And uh, we have found that uh, this has some increased efficacy in immunotherapy. And that is again something that the ideas and first patent did. So I'm going to talk about the magnetoelectric nanoparticles first, and then I'm going to expand more on the phase mimicking antibiotic free nanoparticles, uh, after which I'll basically wrap up this talk. So <laughs> my uh, ongoing research focus can be broken into nanoparticle synthesis. These are actual uh, electron microscopy images. Um, a nanometer is 10 to the power nine, minus 9 meters. So it's really, really small. Uh, you can't even see it on an optical microscope. You need an electron microscope. Um, but the nice thing is by varying the shape and surface properties, you can visually see them as different colors and solution. Uh, and you can also incorporate what are called as different uh, fluorescent emitters into these. So the same nanoparticles can emit in red, green, or blue. And this is something that allows us to track them when we do cell culture experiments. You add the particles. And uh, you just shine, for example, to look at red light, you excite in the green region and limit red color, so you can track them. 
but when we go into animal models, these same particles, if they have gold, you can use x ray contrast. Um, if they have iron or, or uh, gadolinium, you can use MRI contrast. And so we have multiple means by which we can track them. And the way that we make them useful for our purposes is that we modify the surface using different chemical techniques. And uh, you all heard of antibodies, and this is an actual outline of an antibody using an electron microscope, uh, with which we actually use the nanoparticles to target ovarian cancer. So, so this is our expertise. It's like we make nanomaterials, we can modify them, we can track them using different techniques. And so we just kind of went with that, and this is this was recently published. And uh, very happy to say, actually, that this is where uh, the first author is an undergraduate researcher. So that goes on to show that learning undergrads are pretty good if you guide them the right way. It's very rare for an undergraduate researcher to get a first author paper. Uh, but Margo was borderline crazy. She was sleeping four hours a night and getting stuff done. So, so didn't encourage her to do that, but she did it. Um, really happy that she was able to publish this. So very proud of her. She's, a, um, she's now a med student in Ohio State. Um, so, so what we did was uh, we have this concept where right now, if you have cancer, like um, like a metastatic breast cancer, um, speaking to some of the people who actually underwent treatment, they said doxorubicin is like a standard of care, and uh, doxorubicin has uh, severe side effects, like you have urotoxicity, you have cardiotoxicity, uh, but this is accepted. This is accepted as Part of the process, and then you just have to bear with it. Uh, so, essentially, patients' quality of life is affected, but the doctors, I believe, tell them you're going to live, you're going to survive this, and so this is the price that you have to pay. That's that's ex that's what we the feedback we got from people who actually underwent these treatments. <clears throat> so, so what we figured was uh, essentially this is toxic everything, uh, but cancer cells have a voracious appetite, so they take up more of these. So we think cancer cells die more than the normal cells, uh, but clearly from the patient's point of view, this is a very painful process. And so what we proposed was if we immobilize these nanoparticles on the magnetoelectric nanoparticles, and then essentially what we do is uh, we make them not toxic because they can't act anymore. Uh, but we can localize them to the cancer cells by using a magnetic field. And then by using an alternating magnetic field, which will cause the magnetic core to contract and expand, uh, which actually crack the, this PSO electric shell to, it's essentially like cracking an eggshell. And so it's basically cracking the shell and releasing the doxorubicin once it's in the cancer site. So that was our hypothesis. And uh, as I said, because it's a magnetic core, uh, we had ion oxide in it. Uh, so we did test to see if we can. Uh, uh, track it using MRI, and we were able to track it using MRI. It was comparable to what is used commercially, it's called Resolvis. And as I mentioned before, we also put fluorescents and uh, we, we could put green or red fluorescents. And because the reason is every time you do an experiment, you start with the cells, you have to track the particle, and then when it goes in vivo, we track them using the MRI uh, spectrum. So we did do a lot of studies. Uh, this showed one image here where uh, we injected these nanoparticles into mice. Uh, these are ex vivo. We pull the organs out after different time points post-injection. And essentially, we just uh, saw how well it's laid out. We don't want them to accumulate non specifically uh, We also did what's called this uh, inductively coupled mass spec. Uh, essentially, you burn the sample and see if you get a specific wavelength that's emitting. And we found out that these nanoparticles do get cleared through the GI tract, which is good. You don't want them to accumulate in the liver or lungs. And then uh, we also looked at biocompatibility and cytocompatibility, cytocompatibility being uh, with cells. So we used uh, human blood vessel cells, and uh, we didn't see any of them dying. And the doctor was on the nanoparticle, which is a good sign. Uh, and the same thing, we have our pathologist in Harper, uh, Dr. Kalini. Uh, who looked at the tissue and he said, uh, as far as he was concerned, he didn't see any, like, like there was no inflammation more than the control after exposure to these particles. All of these were good, meaning like doxorubicin on the nanoparticles was actually not having a harmful effect as opposed to doxorubicin that you just straight up inject into a patient. So that's all very good, but with our hypothesis that if you release it from the nanoparticles work, 
Uh, the, so what we did was, what you see here in green is the control cells, the blood vessel cells, and the y-axis is the dead cells. So we really don't want them to die, but uh, with free doxorubicin or doxorubicin plus diphylin, which is a combinatorial therapy, uh, we pretty much were killing all the normal cells. There was not, nothing alive. Um, but the triple negative breast cancer cells, we hit maybe a maximum of nine percent cells. Uh, however, when we used our nanoparticles, localized them to the cancer cells, and then did the release, uh, we completely flipped the script. Uh, because here we can see as the concentration goes up, uh, we were getting up to 90 percent uh, or 88 percent cell death of the cancer cells, whereas uh, the QX alone, there was only about 28 percent death. So this is good news because this is the normal amount of cell death that you see in QX even if you don't treat them. So we completely took the script. I'm of course oversimplifying it here. I'm not going to tell you exactly what you put on the surface, but uh, there is a, there are certain surface properties that we changed, which allowed us to release these doxorubicin only in the cancer cells and not in the QX. So the QX here were also exposed to an alternating magnetic field. Uh, but because of this unique surface property that we put on there, uh, the release dogs were still trapped on the surface, whereas in the acidic environment of the cancer cells, the dogs actually went in and actively targeted their DNA. So we completely flipped the script, and then we did material invasion assay. Um, essentially, what this is, is uh, you have a chain, you have a membrane, you grow your cells on top, and then you add your therapeutic. If the cells die, they won't migrate to the bottom of the membrane. Uh, but if the cells are metastatic, they will actively try to move away from the stuff that's killing them to another region. That's how metastasis works. So what we found out was uh, if we use doxorubicin alone, uh, there was significant uh, invasion, like it moves away and to a different site. But when we use doxorubicin and diphylin, we pretty much reduce like the movement of these cells by like. Compared to this, this was only about two or three percent of the cells that moved away. Ideally, we don't want any of them moving, but it's still pretty significant in that diphylin was able to completely stop their ability to move from it. So this is very exciting. Uh, this was for breast cancer, triple negative cells. Um, we also tested it against uh, prostate cancer, metastatic cells, and ovarian cancer, metastatic cells. Um, this was actually a chemo resistant one. And in each case, uh, we were able to. I know you guys can't read this, but in each case, uh, we were able to show that when we release the dogs or the dogs plus diphylin from the nanoparticles, we were able to flip the script where the orange is the dead cancer cells and blue is the dead QX cells. And so we made it really biocompatible and very specific to killing the cancer cells. Um, so this has been very promising, and we've actually extended this to another study, which I've not shown here, which is esophageal adenocarcinoma. And uh, we also want to test out on colorectal cancer because these are other things uh, that seem to metastasize, um, which would benefit from something like this, where without having a target human, you're actually able to target the cancer cells, not the blood vessels, and actually deliver this therapy. So, like I said, the highlights are um, we definitely increase the stability of the drug by binding it to the nanoparticle. And also reduce toxicity, like systemic toxicity, when you deliver it through the blood vessels. Uh, we definitely increase toxicity of cancer cells. These are the three that I've shown here. And uh, when we use a combination of doxorubicin and diphylin, uh, which is a vascular ATPS inhibitor, uh, we found out that uh, not only kill the cells more efficiently, but also prevented them from moving from one place to another. So uh, the other thing is. This is, this is also significant because doxorubicin is water soluble, whereas diphylin is only soluble in something like oil, like an oil emulsion. Uh, but once we put it on the nanoparticles, we can co deliver them in an aqueous mixture. And that is another thing that, like patients who survive metastatic cancer, they said um, one of the biggest pains is just receiving the chemotherapy, that oil emulsion, that they sit, they have to sit there for hours and the whole hand feels numb. Um, the brain feels foggy. Uh, it's, it's just not a good thing. And some of them even said they had to change their career. Like one lady was a lawyer. She said she could not be a lawyer after the treatment. And that's these are kind of things where when you hear it, you definitely know like, okay, it's more than just 
cardiacoxidy is also like uh, you're losing memory capacity and you're having your cognitive so. so it's always better if you can deliver this in an aqueous formulation and which is what we've shown here and uh, as I said uh, we were able to reduce the invasive capability of cancer cells uh, with the MDAM up to 70 percent less than the control with uh, ovarian and prostate cancer we were hitting consistently about 95 percent so as far as the current status, the next milestones go, uh, like I said, um, we do work closely with the idea center because we want to see um, if there's any way to get this into the clinic, or if there's any way to test this and see if it's beneficial for actual patients. Uh, so uh, idea center is something that works closely with us. They also work closely with the Harper Cancer Research Center. Uh, so we have done in vitro studies. We have done everything that we can in vitro. Uh, and we are in the process of doing in vivo validation, uh, where what we're doing is we induce tumor in mice, uh, and then we add these nanoparticles and use a magnetic field to see uh, if we can localize it to the tumor and not other tissue. And uh, when I say magnetic field, we don't stick it on the tumor, we actually expose the whole mouse cage, because our concept is we don't want to know the location of the tumor, uh, we just want to expose the body to the magnetic field, and then the particles by the magnetic nature, it will automatically localize to the tumor. So that would be milestone one as far as in vivo validation. And then, and then milestone two would be uh, once we know we can compartmentalize it to the tumors, uh, we want to release the dogs. Uh, we want to do a three week, uh, we, we want to treat them once a week for three weeks and then see how the tumor shrinks. Uh, we will use a pathologist to see if there's how many metastatic sites here to get reduced. And uh, we also actually test to see if we can use MRI to not only image but release these therapeutics. Uh, so these are our next milestones. We are hoping to at least hit milestone one before this academic year ends. And uh, before next year ends, we are hoping to hit milestone two as well. So we'll keep you guys posted on that. And so then this brings me to our next big uh, focus in our group, which is. Uh, Failure became antibiotic free broad spectrum antibacterial. Uh, we have, this is our most recent publication, and we have one more, two more in the works right now. So, uh, this was run by Dr. Hoff. Uh, Margo was involved in the nanoparticle synthesis site. And then uh, we also worked with Professor Sean Lee in the biology group and Professor Frank Castellino, who runs the Keck Transgenic Center. So, for this, uh, we have tested these nanoparticles against seven drug-resistant bacteria. Um, some of them are actually part of what's called the escape pathogens. Uh, they are the most common source of infection. And so this one over here is MRSA. This is from a cystic fibrosis patient. Uh, Coronavacuum striatum is from an infected heart stent. Uh, e. fecalis was actually from a patient with um, implant failure, it's poor hygiene. Um, don't know if it was the surgeon's fault or the patient's fault, but normally this happens when there's some improper sterilization before they do the surgery. And then uh, abomania is something that's very prevalent in uh, veteran affairs hospitals, as well as uh, DOD uh, field of operations. Uh, K pneumonia is just an escape pattern, and then streptococcus pyogenes is this known to cause. Uh, sepsis and other diseases. And so these are the things that we tested against. The ones in green are gram positive, the ones in um, bold color are gram negative. And only the gram negative ones, uh, the more higher ones to treat, just because they form a biofilm and they're really hard to get out from the wounds or any other place. Here. So why do we focus on this? It's because uh, antibiotic resistance continues to grow. Uh, it's become a big part of hospital acquired infections, chronic wound infections. It's a really big burden on uh, uh, insurers, public health systems, uh, and it actually contributes to people staying in the hospital for two or three days more than they normally would. And this is especially burdensome for, uh, in a country like the US, the insurers are really, they cringe every time they have to pay for this. They cringe every time they have to pay for anything, but. Uh, <laughs> Then, uh, but in places like Canada or UK or France, where they have public uh, health system, uh, where the taxpayer has to pay for all of this, they're really feeling this because 
Um, number of antibiotic infections are going up. People have to stay there longer. And just because they stay longer doesn't necessarily mean they're able to cure it. They just bring it back down to manageable levels, send them home, and then there's a recurrence of bacterial infection. So it would be really great uh, if we could come up with a system that's not an antibiotic because people do not follow instructions. And that's one of the reasons why, if you don't take the full course of antibiotics, that contributes to some bacteria developing resistance and then they spread it to others. Uh, so what we thought was there's something called the space therapy. Uh, bacteriophages are very, they're viruses that are very successful in killing bacteria. And uh, over millions of years, bacteria has not really come up with a way to counter phages. They try a few things, but for the most part, the phages are very effective in killing. Uh, the only problem with phage therapy is if you use it in humans, after one or two times, the human body will recognize that as a foreign entity and then start attacking it. And so what we came up with is, why can't we just mimic the structure of the page and see how well uh, that acts as an anti-bacterial? So uh, we created silicon nanoparticles and then we put gold silicon alloys on top of it. And we try to mimic the spacing between these protein turrets on a page uh, with our gold silicon nanoalloys. And as a first step, we just wanted to see uh, what happened. And so it's a very modular assembly. You can swap out components. Um, and so silica, then we put gold, and then we have a silver on it. And uh, essentially what we saw was uh, something that was promising in the sense, I'm gonna show only two bacteria here. Um, this is a normal growth, and then we saw bacterial stasis, meaning it slowed down the growth of bacteria, but it was not killing them. So um, it was definitely slowing down the rate at which the bacteria was growing. This is MRSA or SNAP or yes. And then we saw the same thing with Pseudomonas, where again, it was only slowing down, uh, but it was not really killing. But this is still significant because uh, we have not seen this before with any other nanoparticle. And so we did take a look at it under a uh, dark field microscope. And what we saw was these particles were permanently binding themselves to the membrane of the bacteria. So if you take MRSA, it's normally nice and spherical. Uh, it's, um, it's like a nice sphere. But with the nanoparticles, what was happening was they were, they were not able to divide. The particles were binding to the membrane and not allowing the bacteria to split, which is what was causing them to slow down in their growth. And we have published this. I'm not going to go into this table. Especially we looked at different nanoparticle sizes, different silver concentrations, um, and saw how this affected the different bacteria. But in each case, we were not getting any cells that we were just getting retardation. So it was promising enough, new enough that we did publish it. But our next question was, uh, we have this nice gold and silver surface, which we can modify with thiol, which we've done previously before. So how about if we put a polymer on this, which has a lot of positive charge, would that make it more antibacterial? And so we saw two interesting results here. Uh, one is, it was, again, only slowing the growth for staph aureus. But it became highly specific in killing C. striatum, which is common on implants. And uh, no matter what we did, uh, the C. striatum just would not grow in the presence of this polymer for the nanoparticle. And so this really uh, was promising because then Zimmer Biomed said, well, we have a lot of problems because everything grows on our implant. We have to be really careful when we do the surgery. So if we give you some metals, can you modify that and see what happens? And so that's what we did. Uh, we took some of these implant grade materials, uh, polished them, modified them with our nanoparticles in the polymer. Uh, this is an SEM image of uh, nanoparticles on the surface of the uh, metal group on. And just to show you, uh, what we found out was if we didn't modify the surface, just like they said, everything grows on it. MRSA, pseudomonas, you can see them just happy, happy, happy. They're just there. And that's why they had to be like, really well sterilized before they use it, to the point where even the patient's skin had to be completely sterilized because any bacteria here, when they cut it, when they put the implant, if it goes in, that will start infecting the implant and cause failure. Uh, the cells themselves, that the human cells themselves were not that happy. They were adhering, but they're not spreading out as you would expect healthy cells to. But once we expose them to our, uh, we put our nanoparticles with the polymer, uh, what we found out was pseudomonas was not only dying, but it could hardly stay on the surface. 
Staff warriors was dying on contact. Uh, we're happy that they're still staying there. They, we would like them to slide off. But the good news is there was nothing alive there. Like the red channel indicates dead cells. And uh, we looked at SEM and we hardly saw any bacteria. And any bacteria that touched the surface died. But more importantly, the human skin cells, um, they were really spreading out nicely, uh, behaving like healthy cells and attaching themselves very nicely. So, so this is just some preliminary results that we have. Uh, we are now looking at the combinations where uh, not only do the bacteria die on contact, but essentially we want them to slip off, like it's a non-stick, like a, a non-stick cookware, we just want them to slide out, we don't want them to be there at all. And so we're getting some success on that. That's again something you run for a tech hunt for all this. Uh, but so this opened up a separate line of work as far as implant modifications go. But we were thinking, what about how can we continue to kill the bacteria? Like if we want to kill bacteria and wounds, promote wound healing. And uh, so that's where our collaborator Sean Lee came in, uh, which is he makes these peptide sequences. Peptides are just amino acids, and they're like 20 to 30 amino acids small. And so he makes these amino acid sequences, which are derived from uh, naturally occurring antimicrobial peptides. Uh, we also did a literature search and found one which is secreted by a frog and found on its skin. And so what we did was we put these on our gold super nano alloys um, and then tested them against human cells. Uh, long story short, all the variants and controls were completely biocompatible. Uh, we didn't see any difference between control and treated ones. Um, we did this, we did multiple versions of this. In each case, we found out that uh, normally the particles were biocompatible, uh, but the particles also were able to increase the concentration of peptides that we could treat or expose the human cells to. For example, here, uh, if you use 64 micromolar of um, this particular peptide, uh, you're getting about 60% of the cells dead. But here on the nanoparticles, uh, we was getting about 30% of the cells dead. So we could actually increase the therapeutic window by putting it on these nanoparticles. So this is where uh, we got a really exciting news, and this is where we're going after more funding for this, is uh, again, we tried different sizes uh, with uh, different silver concentration. And we actually found out that all of these four bacteria, none of them survived once we exposed them to this particular uh, antibacterial nanoparticle, uh, which had uh, MC121 in the surface. So we did polyforming assays after exposing them to this particle, there is no survival. Uh, we also checked it out other peptides. Uh, we were getting really good bacteria there, uh, but we also found out that silver concentration is an important component in the antibacterial activity, so we can't discuss silver. Uh, and then, of course, we went on ahead, did Baumania. This is something that came from the Middle East, actually. Uh, we found out our bacteria, uh, our particles are extremely efficient in killing it, compared to the free peptides, uh, we were definitely having higher efficacy of killing with the particles. And like I said, these particles increase the therapeutic, you know, that's where this comes into play, because we could go with a higher concentration of peptides on the particles, still keep the biocompatibles, but end up killing the bacteria. And same story with pneumonia, we were able to kill it. Um, and uh, uh, Streptococcus pyogenes, uh, we were actually able to kill it at even a lower concentration of the free peptide. So again, I'm, I'm just rushing through this. None of this is as easy as I make it sound. Uh, <laughs> yes. uh, uh, so, so we were really excited that we saw all this uh, because we were literally knocking out one bacteria after another. Uh, and then we spoke with Walter Reed uh, Army Infectious Hospital. And they said, yeah, this is really interesting. But then they said, they have nastier bacteria that they didn't think it tested. So, so, so that's another part where we play is uh, DOD has access to way more nastier bugs than we can ever have. Um, they require a higher way of biosecurity level, like biosecurity level three or four. Um, we will have a biosecurity level three on campus, but I'd much rather prefer someone who's been doing this for 10 years or 15 years handle these bacteria. So this is another thing that's we as an institute, we do this networking 
And uh, they said they'll be more than happy to test our particle. Uh, summarize, uh, this is a paid mimicking nanoparticle. It's antibiotic free. Uh, we've tried topical, we've tried injecting it. Uh, we've tried using it for sterilizing applications. Uh, a lot of these are actually uh, for field hospital uses. And uh, we think the novelty is, unlike phages, there's hardly any immunogenicity. And uh, it's hard for bacteria to develop resistance to this. And then uh, we can also tune the spectrum. We can either make it broad spectrum or specific to one bacterial uh, species. So with that, I'm just going to put our goals again. Uh, like I said, we look for clinical partners, physician, um, networks that can help some of our PDIs to either get access to resources or uh, help them uh, with funding to push it from PIL4 to PIL6. Uh, or if anyone is interested in licensing stuff from our PI, they're more than happy to put you in touch with them and investigate that as well. And uh, finally, uh, these are the people who did the bulk of the work. This is my grad student. Uh, she's my postdoc. She's, she's also my wife. <laughs> 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 then uh, uh, these are the two undergrads who actually work. Deb, I don't have a photo, but she does all the animal experiments and she does a wonderful work. She's in okay. Um, And then uh, we had funding from all these different sources over time. And really thank you to Harper for uh, their, they not only put us in touch with the industrial advisory board that uses external input that has been really useful. Uh, but they also have the seed grants and other. The Harper Symposium is a great place to exchange ideas and make collaboratives. And of course, Andrew also <laughs> hooks me up with swag and stuff. I'm here for the teacher. <laughs> so, so thank you guys for taking your Saturday off your time. Yeah, I don't find a place to motivate this man is to give him a new polo. Somehow I don't. <laughs> Well, thank you, everyone, for coming. Um, we have time now for a few questions. Where's your heads to spin? Who's got questions? Yeah. Here's some questions. All right. Here's the Okay, go ahead. Did you think about testing this against um, what used to be called bacterium acne, now called Q bacterium acne? It's responsible for a lot of shoulder infections, but also for actually acne. Um, we, we are actually in the process of testing it against staph and pre dermitis uh, because we found that uh, that was actually isolated from quite a few implant infections by the shower group. Uh, but that's a, we heard of that one, but we have not thought of testing it against that. Yes, sir. Uh, anyone else? All right. Well, just when I think I can't be more impressed by our researchers, I learn more about their research. So thank you very much. Thank you.